In this video, I'm going to expand upon some of the topics covered in the most recent videos, indexing, intervals, lin space, matrices, and such. This is part 016 underscore indexing.m, link to the full playlist as well as that file in the video description. All right, I'm going to start off by running this code at the top that's going to clear off my workspace, clear off the command window, close any graphs or figures that I may have open, and set the formatting that I like to use. Control Enter. Now also in that same section, I'm going to create a vector that's going to contain the numbers starting at 4, ending at 16, and going up by 1 each time. So this is an interval with a default step size or increment of 1. So I just say a number that I want to start with, colon, number that I want to end with, and I'm going to put that information into the variable named v. I'm going to display out the transpose of v because I think the vertical display is easier to read. The apostrophe there is giving me that transpose. If I get rid of it, well, then it says all this columns text. I don't like that. I don't. I think that's hard to read, so I put the apostrophe on there. Scrolling on down, suppose I want multiples of 5, or really an increase of 5, starting at 10 and going up to 93. One thing that you might ask yourself is, well, 93 is not a multiple of 5. If I keep adding 5 each time, I'm not actually going to hit 93 specifically. So what do you think happens here when we run it? Control Enter. Well, what happens is we go up as high as we can and we stop when we get to 93. So it includes 90, but it does not include 95. Next section, Control Enter. The middle number between the colons is what we're going to add to the first number repeatedly until we get to this final number. And we can count down. So here's our results here. It's good to be curious about any new programming language or really anything that you're trying to learn. And so one question that we might ask ourselves here is, well, what happens if my middle number says we should decrease, but my last number is higher than my starting number? Well, you know, try it out. Put 24 there, control enter. And it looks like we get nothing. Although if I type in V, V actually does exist. It is an empty double row vector. Change that back and continue on down. Lin space is related to intervals in that Intervals, that's the colon notation up here, as well as this lin space function, both are going to generate vectors with an even spacing between numbers. The difference is, scrolling up, that here we specify how much we're going to add each time. Whereas with lin space, we specify the start, the finish, and how many total numbers we want. So I'm going to run this section, control enter, and I get 15 total numbers starting at 1 and going up to 100. Now, what would I need to add each time to make that work? Well, apparently 7.0714, because that's what I add to 1 to get this. And then if I add that again, I get this, and so on. So LinSpace figures out for me what the spacing needs to be. This code right here, I wrote it using these variables just because I thought that would help illustrate what's happening. It is the same as this much shorter version in the comment right here. Scrolling on down. This next section is review of vectors. I'm going to run this section, control enter, and I'm going to scroll up in my command window. All right, so here's my first vector that I created. I named the variable row vector, and I separated the numbers with commas. That creates a horizontal vector, one row, multiple columns. If I separate the numbers with semicolons, I get a column vector, or a vertically oriented vector. So this is many rows, one column. Scrolling on down, vectors are matrices. They are very much the same thing. A vector is simply a one-dimensional matrix. So in my row vector, I can request row 1, column 3, but I don't have to use the row because there's only one. So I could just put in the parentheses the number that I want. I want the third number out of my vector. And that third number is 7, whether we specify the row and the column, or just simply the column. With the column vector, I do a similar thing, except I request row 4, column 1. Now, because there's only one column, I don't really need the comma 1, and I can just specify that I want the fourth element of the vector. Continuing on down, this is new. Intervals can be used for indexing. So row vector right here is a vector of numbers, one row, many columns. And in the parentheses of row vector on this next line, I am requesting the third through fifth elements of my vector. Now I named my variable over here Boeing 737 because when I first wrote this example I just typed these numbers in randomly and then saw that I had 737 in there. So if I want to extract out, I want to copy out these 737s, well these are the third, fourth, and fifth numbers. 
So I can say row vector parentheses three colon five, and then when I display out, I haven't run this section yet, but I'm gonna do it now, control enter, I get 737. Now I get it twice because then I do it again down here to illustrate that what I've written here is the same as what I have written right here. I can just put in a vector with square brackets and everything inside of those parentheses. These extra spaces are just for illustration purposes. They are not mandatory. And I want to emphasize that in MATLAB, anywhere where you can put a list of numbers, you can put a vector or you can put something that generates a vector, such as an interval or even the use of lin space. Scrolling on down. What if I just want to grab the sevens out of my vector? I don't want the fourth value. I just want the third and the fifth. You can do that. You can index non-consecutive values, which is what I do here. I say from the row vector, I would like the third and fifth values, and I'm going to put those into a new variable named just sevens. So when I run this section, I just get the sevens. Continuing on down, let's review and expand upon matrices. I'm going to widen my screen here and then run this section, control enter, scrolling up in my command window. All right, I've got a matrix named M right there. I create it, there's the output. And this matrix right here is actually the exact same as the matrix M that I create right here. Now, for a relatively small matrix, three rows, four columns, it doesn't really help me very much to use intervals in each row to generate those rows, but I can. I can say one colon four instead of typing out one, two, three, four. And you can imagine that if I'm creating a significantly larger matrix where each row has one of these patterns, it can be very handy to save ourselves time by using intervals to generate the matrix. Continuing on down in the same section, I can index into a matrix using the same technique that I just demonstrated with vectors. I can say from matrix M, give me rows two and three and columns two through four. And when I put that information into a variable named submatrix and display it out, what I get is this right here. And you can see where this came from in the larger matrix M. It's this right here. That is an intersection, not a union, of those rows and columns. Continuing on down, same section though. I think that example is easier to read like this, and I strongly encourage you to use this sort of organization. Create a variable named rows that has a vector of the rows that you want to access. Create a variable named columns that has a vector of the columns you want to access, and then access whatever your matrix variable's name is, in the parentheses, rows first, comma, columns. Grab that submatrix, display it out, and I get the same result as I just did. Continuing on down, control enter to run this section, scrolling up in my command window. My matrix got a little uh, jumbled, so I'm gonna rerun it with a wider screen, control enter, there we go, it all fits in there. All right, here's my matrix M. I'm using intervals to generate this matrix. So three rows, five columns. Suppose I want part of row two. I mean, that's just my variable name. I could have named it anything, could have named it X or Y or whatever. But put into that variable, from matrix M, row two, columns three through five. Well, row two, columns three through five, and there we go, we get those results. Suppose I just want part of column four. Well, what part? Maybe I want rows one and two, column four right here. I've added the spacing in just to show you that I can. You should use whatever organization works for you. So there is that part of column four, and that indeed is my output. What if I want all of column four? Well, just the colon by itself is a way of saying all rows or all columns. Now, how do you tell which it is? Well, if it comes before the comma, you're getting all the rows, and in this case, column four. If the colon comes after the comma, you're getting whatever rows you're getting and all columns. This is all of column four, right? Seven, eight, nine right there. I scroll down slightly. There's the seven, eight, nine. If instead I do four colon and run it, well, I get an error because there isn't a fourth row. So oops, let's try that again with row two, all columns. Great. So now the variable name doesn't make as much sense, but there's row two, all columns, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Scrolling up, that is indeed what I get, although I changed the width of my screen, so it's on two separate lines. And finally, end. End is a very useful keyword. I noted in an earlier video not to name any of your variables end because it will conflict with this built-in keyword uh, that MATLAB provides for us. 
And what we can do is we can say on this line of code, put into this new variable here, from m, row two, columns three through the end, three through the remaining columns, however many there may be. Now in this case, this is three through five. So I'm literally going to get the exact same result from this line of code as I got up here. And if I scroll down, you can, you can see that. But what's super useful about this is, suppose we don't have five columns. Suppose we don't know how many columns we have, but we're certain that we want from three all the way to the end. Good news, this code will work. End works in either the row position before the comma or in the column position after the comma. So if I want the bottom right value in my matrix, whatever value that may be, this will always access that value from matrix M, whatever matrix M refers to. And it's very important to note, end is essentially a variable. It has a numeric value. When there are five columns, this end is five. When there are three rows, this end is three, and this one is not. This is a different value. This is five in this example that I'm working in. And so suppose I want the second to last row in column one. Well then, I can say from M, give me the last row minus one and the first column. And you can see there's my result right there. That's the number five. If I scroll back up, second to last row, column one. And that's the same five right there. And I can do other operations on it. Subtract one, divide by two. End is a variable. It is a number. It's a weird kind of variable though, because it's context sensitive. It represents something different when it's before the comma as opposed to after the comma. Continuing on down. Matrices can also be modified using intervals. Let me run this last section, control enter. Let me change my screen width and try that again. I'd really like to fit this all on the screen, but I'm also wanting to use a very large font. All right, so here I generate an arbitrary matrix using some intervals, also just put some twos in, more intervals, and there's the matrix right there. Then on this line of code, what am I doing? Another excellent way to learn MATLAB or any other programming language, or many other things as well, is to try to predict what's gonna happen next or guess at what something does before you actually test out and see whether it does that. It's an exercise for your brain, whether you're right or wrong. Now, you may already be able to see on the screen what's happening here. I'm creating a new vector, one, two, three, four, five, but I'm putting that vector into matrix M in place of row two, all columns. So I first had my original row two with just all twos, but now I've put into that location one, two, three, four, five. Scrolling down slightly. What if I want to replace a two by two? Rows one and two, columns three and four from those rows with just a chunk of zeros, a two by two of zeros. So now this is what I'm starting with, but this line of code modifies this matrix M and turns it into this. And you can see that group of zeros right there has been inserted. Now it is important that we put a square peg in a square hole and a round peg in a round hole. So in this example, I can't put in one fewer number into this location because it's looking for four numbers. If I try, I get an error because the size of the left side is this and the size of the right side is this. They don't match up. Always also read your error messages. What a helpful error message telling me exactly what sizes I'm dealing with and how they don't match up. Same thing here, if I make it too small or if I make it too large. That also doesn't work. All right, so now if I've got this matrix and I run this line of code, I'm gonna replace rows one and three, non-consecutive rows, column two with 99s. So instead of the five to 11, now I have 99, two, 99. I left the two alone because I skipped that in my indexing. You can do that. You don't have to use consecutive indexes. Indexing is super flexible in MATLAB. This is one of the best implemented features in MATLAB and it's extremely flexible and there's a lot you can do with it. We're gonna to continue to use and look at indexing throughout this video series, but that is all for this video.